Dr. Noam wishes he could kiss tail like Ensign Essencia. The Borg Cube is an engineer's dream. And Zero thinks the Borg are a chatty bunch. Hello, everybody, and welcome to The Seventh Rule with Sirach Lofton. Hello, hello. And Bonnie Gordon, of course. It's me. Yeah. I'm still here. <laughs> My name is Ryan T. Husk. Today, we're doing a review of Prodigy, Season 1, Episode 12, Let Sleeping Borg Lie, directed by... Olga Ulanova and Sung Shin, please let me know if I pronounce those correctly, written by Good Deandra, Deandra yeah. Pendleton yeah. Thompson. Uh, there we you are go. joined by two very special guests, Kevin and Dan Hageman, showrunners of Star Trek Prodigy. Hello, Woo. how are you guys doing? Hey, Fan we're good. Fantastic. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, round of applause. Hit the applause button. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Great energy. Um, wait, wait, yeah, wait for the applause to die down. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Hold there on, hold on, hold on. There we go. Don't, go don't okay. stop. Okay. No, really, don't stop. <laughs> it's okay. I'm gonna have a lot of work to do in post, aren't I? Yeah, I have to add. Have to get this up. <laughs> First of all, can we just say congratulations to Prodigy for the Emmy nomination? Shocked, but we shouldn't be. You know what I mean? Really cool. It, you know. Yes. Thank you. I mean, uh, it, it was. We were nervous. I remember it was the first thing we did that morning, where Kevin had brought it up on his screen, and we slowly, we slowly, you know, you saw each nominee, and I was like, "Oh my gosh, if our show isn't recognized, it's going to be a super bum day." Hmm. And then we saw <laughs> that our show was up for uh, most outstanding animated show, and it just, you know, I we feel so proud of it because it's an award that every single person on the crew can share it. It's like, we honestly feels like from the music to the main title cards to Ben to everything that everyone's putting in, it's a great umbrella award for that. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. And I want to congratulate you too, personally, because um, that is a big accomplishment. One thing that I've had conversations with people about before in the Star Trek um, universe is how Star Trek doesn't get recognized by the Emmys um for the work that they do on television because mm -hmm. sci-fi is always in this category of or at least star trek specifically is in this category of its own and they don't recognize it uh for the work you know and the craftsmanship of the collective uh people putting this together a lot of individual awards like you know best makeup obviously we get uh visual effects and, and um composers for example but um like you said never really recognition for the the entire show um the just not even as a, a, whole. As a yeah. series as a whole yeah. and it's and it's about time that um that they finally acknowledge that and i'm glad that you guys are doing it and breaking the uh, mold on that that's that's a, that's a fabulous thing thank you sir thank you thank you mm -hmm. yeah I, I agree in the sense of like uh sci-fi shows do get the short end of the stick it's like they go okay of course they're going to get sound editing and sound mixing uh, but they don't Makeup. ever really respect the content, right. the, the the content or the uh, performances. So um, um, we're really happy. We're really proud to to you know work on a Star Trek show that we were afraid to work on, and we we're happy that we got it to this place where other people are seeing it and people are recognizing um, the merit of the crew's work. Actually, I have to yeah. say, Dan, if you remember, can I just add like yeah. very early on when we were writing it. I think Dan, like we were like we were going for an Emmy. It might be a stupid goal to go for, but we were like we're going for an Emmy for the show. You know, really? day one, wow. we were, that that was we were pushing ourselves. I so laughed hard at my brother when he said up. that. I said, "Kevin, <laughs> get out of here." Oh, I, we, our whole team has gone above and beyond anything, yeah. and expect. And even if you look at the business side, like I'm not going to talk about numbers, but if you saw the amount of money we spend, it is so much. Uh, uh, smaller than what a lot of animated shows out there spend, and uh, especially for what uh, it's just we've really put in everything on screen. Yeah, I, I don't know about the numbers, but I know about the quality of the yep. result. And mm -hmm. when I'm watching the show, I feel like this is I, I keep saying it to Ryan, I'm like, this is motion picture quality every time, motion mm -hmm. picture quality. This is mm -hmm. like I feel like I'm watching a movie. Um, and usually that kind of animation is really highly budgeted and it's a lot of time to produce one particular, you know, Toy Story movie. But 
you guys are doing this um, episode by episode, and the production value, the the scripts, the the morals of the story. I mean, it's just it all is seamlessly uh, put together, and I, I really am just like overwhelmed by the uh, the product that you guys are putting out. I think, and Bonnie can attest to like when you come to like the screenings, we'll do we'll do screenings for crew, and like you know, there's not that many of us. It's 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 a small crew, but like yeah. it's a small and dedicated, and we all work our tails off. And uh, just like the there proto star, love it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we are small exactly. but mighty. Small but mighty. <laughs> yeah, but also, I, have, I also I. I was gonna say I have a dream of like seeing like I have a dream that like okay the show continues to do well and that yeah we'll do some fan event or something where we'll rent a giant movie theater and in within you know for what three and a half hours you can pretty much watch you know and uh, wow I, I, I don't not the math I don't want to do the math but just to watch a whole <laughs> like, bunch of episodes <laughs> math the yeah. are coming up for Kevin twenty two right? minutes. Times ten, two yeah. Like, yeah, 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 how many hours? That's not, that's not. Yeah, that's not my forte. No. <laughs> yeah, one of the things I, I think about is is if if later down the future is is the ability to binge watch, binge watch the show and it kind of just keeps bleeding into the next. So it's such a mm -hmm. a good binge watch um, show. Um, mm -hmm. When you guys come up with some of the concepts for these episodes, are are there any restrictions in the universe of sci-fi that that you have to check with anybody to say hey i'm mm. going to do a board thing is that all right or you know is there any kind of restrictions in that way or do you have the freedom to kind of really explore i think i think we, we have, have the freedom, freedom to make yeah we have the it starts with the freedom and then it's and then you got to like check your p's and q's and you're looking at like can this actually work um you Go know, big, then, then take away a little bit at a time when they start putting yeah. walls around you. Right. Yeah. And usually we're able, to, I mean, with, with strong people like Walt King, the Benson sisters, people who know Star Trek really well, we're able to make a really great case of why it can work. And then mm. we'll bring it to Secret Hideout and, and, and um, some of the grander overseers of Star Trek. And they'll be like, it works. So that, you know, or like David Mack, we had like, you know, season one, we had a Star Trek expert, you know, who every script we had, we'd send it to him and he'd come back with amazing notes, you know, or details to add or no, this won't work, you know? So in fact, yeah. Or did you want to share like at, at one point we were playing with this idea, like, Wait, wait oh, hold on. I thought it, about that. Kevin, hold on. I don't think we should say that because <laughs> is a, somewhat could be a revelation. I, I would say the space. I was going to phrase it in a way, but okay. <laughs> He's got to be safe. I, now I'm, I'm curious. <laughs> no, no. I was going in my head and I was like, ah, kind of like, we'll say it all. Okay. I, I, have, I have something else to throw out there to, to kind of switch it up. Um, you know, one of the storylines that I grew up watching as a kid, and I think you guys, is, you know, being my age, watched the same thing was The Wizard of Oz. Oh, yeah. And yeah. a lot of the a lot of the things, uh, the principles that I got from watching it, just the, the things about courage and life lessons, I feel like um, I'm watching those same kinds of principles and storylines play out in different ways to your characters. Is there is there any truth to that? Yeah, I, I mean, think. Oh, go, go ahead. ahead, Bonnie. No, I was just going to say, um, well, they just want to get to Starfleet, you know. Uh, <laughs> Starfleet's <laughs> not a real wizard at all. <laughs> Thank you, Dorothy. Thank you. You're very welcome. Continue your point. Uh, no, no, I was going to say it's like I think from you know we worked on Ninjago before we worked on Troll Hunter. We worked on we we worked on a lot of family animation. I just feel like lessons work so well in that space. Not because they're needed, but it's like, I don't know. I just, there's a great sense of, you know, who your audience is. And there's going to be, you know, there's obviously adults, but there's also kids who are, who are learning these things for the first time. And it's a powerful medium in order to get some of these themes across. And like, you, you know, Star Trek is a, ma I mean, Star Trek is a massive metaphor to us of going out in space, the great unknown life. Like, what are you going to come up? You know, you're afraid of it, but you got to get out there. Um, and so I think it's just a great tapestry in order to look at grander life lessons of like, what does Star Trek mean to us and how do we, um, package that in little bottles and, and get them out in 22 minute, uh, uh, little 
Absolutely. And, mm-hmm. and let me add also, like, because your episodes are short, um, we always look at Star Trek Prodigy as a giant miniseries. You know, not necessarily, you know, um, it's highly serialized, right? So it feels like a, more like a quest, like Dorothy would go on of the Yellow Brick mm-hmm. Road. Um, and so I think you're getting those life lessons and you're seeing them change in every episode. There's changes mm-hmm. happening within the characters and within the grand story. So. Speaking yeah, of life yeah. lessons. A, oh, go ahead. Sorry. I, I was going to say, speaking of life lessons, I love what I love about Prodigy that, you know, you're looking at a lot of the shows um, that are nominated uh, for the Emmy for Outstanding Series. But what I think stands Prodigy apart from a lot of the others is the extra content outside of the show, like Jane way, um, like with Kate Milgrew's, uh, teaching the lessons after the episode of what each episode means and, and why it's important. And, you know, mm. sen- sending something back for the kids to show them that they did learn something today, you know, that type of thing. And also what I also love about it, the new stuff that Aaron's putting out with, um, uh, Admiral Jane way's logs, like what? That's so great that like mm-hmm. I feel like um it's gonna get a lot of super Trek fans more involved in Prodigy because again, I still see some hesitancy from people saying, Oh, it's for kids. But at the the minute they start watching it, they're realizing no, this is actually just good Star Trek. It's just good sci-fi. Yeah. And all the extra content that Prodigy is bringing in, like the Admiral Logs, um, read by Doctor Kate. Aaron, um, I believe, is gonna be doing something too. And that that's oh, excellent. Cool. Something- yeah, that's something we're always talking about. It'd be really great to, you know, if you watch an episode of Prodigy or or another Star Trek episode to see the to understand the science behind it. Because mm-hmm. you know it's like there's something there that works, but for for a younger audience, it'd be really great to be able to dig into that stuff. It's a rabbit hole of like to learn about wormholes. And like, I mean, mm-hmm. I my son got into wormholes and things like that at the age of eight or nine. And I was like flabbergasted. I'm like, you are, how are you even thinking about these things? But that, <laughs> I think that's what the show is about. It's about sparking Absolutely. that imagination. Mm-hmm. You yeah. know, uh, you also brought up, and, and sometimes you bring up in episodes, like a, a minor message, a minor moral that, you know, that you don't spend too much time on, but it's enough to open up the curiosity of a kid. And by the way, I like to call it a family show more so than just a kid's show, because I do Absolutely. picture this as a, a full scale family show. Adults can very much enjoy this um, as much as kids and they can watch it together. And I think that's really where the sweet spot is, is the, the whole family gathering around to watch it. But like in the previous episode, actually the, the two of you were credited in writing uh, episode 11. There's just that opening scene, which was not just fun and exciting and a great way to jump back into the second half of the season, but it had the message of preservation of species. And that's, that's a really important conversation to have. That's not what the episode was about. And they, they didn't dwell on it too long, the characters, but that message was there. So say a a kid of 10 or 13 can get the message, can grasp it, can understand why it's important. A child of five or six can just ask their parents and say, What's that mean? What's that about? And that opens the door for the parents to have that conversation. And so I thought that was a really good way to throw that message in there in such a great way and explain it so well to where you can open up these conversations for parents to have with kids. And all the adults in their mind are going, Admiral, there'll be whales here in their head. Yeah, I do. Yeah, I do feel like they kind of fudge the prime directive rules a little bit, you know. So it's like they're they're doing some things right, and True. there's other stuff that they're not quite doing right, but they're trying their best. They're getting Which graded is, on a curve, you know. Yeah. It's, it's <laughs> totally. Uh, they're technically not like in Starfleet. Right I mean, technically, <laughs> they don't have to follow the prime directive. It's just a guideline. <laughs> they're not technically in Starfleet yet. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just trying to justify no, I their think actions. I, I, I think they're doing very well. And it's it's great to me how you put the growth in very small, small ways. I saw Dal, for example, in this episode, uh, saving Gwen when he blew up the bridge. And, and he realized, okay, at least one of us gets away, right? And yeah. I, I was like, that's just a, such a mature decision that I don't think the old Dal would have. I was thinking the old Dell would have jumped off the, the edge Oh, he would have, bridge. every man for himself, himself saved himself. Saved himself. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, he would have saved I love himself. That too. What gets lost, Kevin, it's always hard to see, but it's what was the reason the bridge falls in, in the first place? It was because of Jankum. 
There's a scene where his blowtorch, yeah. he turns on his blowtorch and he burns the bridge down, so to speak. Or, you know. yes. And he yes. blames it on the, the Borg. Yeah. Yeah. The Borg. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> he doesn't accept Why did they do that? Yeah. Yeah. But again, yeah, like, but, you know, there's just not a lot of entertainment out there. Like, when I think of what I grew up on, to see characters grow and change, you know, mm. like, I, I don't know. Like the, I mean, yeah, the that's thing that, that comes, yeah, like the thing that the closest thing that comes to my mind would maybe be Luke Skywalker in all three Star Wars movies. You know, you see him yeah. really transform from a farmer boy to the end of you know Jedi. But other than but that, animation like, wise, I, we get center, we yeah. get to do that deeper with a whole season. You know, mm-hmm. and then, and then wait till you guys see what our season two is. I mean, they're just going to continue to grow. It's amazing and change. Oh, tell us about it. Yeah. <laughs> well, yes. it's called Go season there. two. Okay. Season two. Season <laughs> two. And it starts Electric with the first Gallo. episode. <laughs> yeah. um, and you I, were I, there, I, and you, and you. Yeah. Actually, and you very were there. Quickly, is that something great. we can ask you about the seasons? Are the seasons going to now have twenty episodes, or was this a one-time thing, or is this something that's as of yet undecided? I mean, I it's, think for it's, us, it's hard for us to, like, we always think of story in 10, 10 to 13, I mean, for in this case, 10 episode arcs. Um, or, you know, you can go 13 episode arcs, or you can go 18, like 20 episode arcs is quite a bit. And so mm-hmm. we could say a season is 20, but we break it down into a first half and a second half. We're always like... But uh, I'm sorry, let me clarify. Figuring out, going, I, let's just figure out this portion, and then we'll figure out that portion. Mm-hmm. But we always saw it as the first 10 episodes or the first half of season one, in essence, you know, like when we first dreamt it up, how it's labeled, I don't know. But when we pitched the show, we pitched episode one, we pitched the mid, you know, episode 10 and 11, and we and we pitched episode 20. We know where the 20 are going to go. These next 10 are probably some of our favorite episodes. Yeah, everything's so building up to episode 19 and 20. So mm-hmm. it's going to feel oh, like a yeah. definitive end to a season. So then the next, yeah, and I, the next 20 episodes, the official, uh, I don't know what they're, what they're going to call it, but it's like that's going to feel album. like got to change things up. Things are a little different, like it, but it's, a, but it's very much the next the chapter. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, one of the big things that I, uh, you know, I see that you do a lot is uh, contrast, um, the good and the evil. And so you get, have to give us a little bit of both for it to resonate. Mm-hmm. Um, and actually, when you said Ninjago, I was thinking about how Ninjago also had that balance between this kind of good versus evil. Um, in this show, how difficult or what is the challenge about uh, not being too dark or the balance of, you know, not kind of being too much of a, did you see this show. week's episode? <laughs> this episode <laughs> no, was very much like yeah. I felt like this was the Halloween episode. Like, yeah, that's what I felt yes. too. Yeah, totally. even watching it, I was just like, "Oh my god!" Like, yes. I get so nervous. I didn't even know what's going to happen, and I'm like, "Oh no!" <laughs> Actually, I think our everybody's I, buddy, Mr. Aaron Waltke, did say something about that on Twitter, saying this was kind of like the haunted house episode. Yes, yes, uh, yeah. There is. Then that's what we love about Star Trek, or if you're watching an X Files. Like, you never know what the next episode's going to give you. One might be utterly frightening, and one's kind of quirky and funny. And so I think you'll find that, you know, and even like a Strange New World did a really great job with that with their first season. Oh, yeah. You, yeah, know, you each one the audience, like, stood on their own. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. yeah. once they're in their heels and you're, you're expecting everything and you get exactly what you, you think you're going to get, it's no fun. It's like it's the element of surprise that keeps you what's going to happen next, which keeps you leaning in. Mm-hmm. Well, this just, the yeah. board just popped out of nowhere. So I was like, "What the yeah. hell's going on here?" <laughs> well, I just want to add I mean, we're in the well. Delta Quadrant. You have to hit. You have to hit the board. It's I like, just want to add it. as well that your what you're doing is even more difficult than just each episode has a different tone because you're you're doing each episode has a different tone or is in a different style within a serialized show. So you have this mm-hmm. long ten to twenty episode serialized arc. And and each section has its own tone, which you're really, you know, you're making life a lot harder for yourselves, but it's working for us. So thank you for doing that. You are, that I'm just picturing, 
Yeah, I'm picturing you're at Baskin and Robbins and you're just going down <laughs> tasting from every bin. You're just going down the row because you just want to try them. <laughs> like I got kicked out 30, for that, actually. This is good. 32 flavors There's 31 and then more some. flavors, yeah. 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 <laughs> Uh, the Jamok almond fudge, please. <laughs> uh-huh. They tried to do 33 flavors, but that last one was like, this one's crap. Pick, yeah. Go it was- 32. No, no. Um, the moment, I mean, I thought zero was really the, uh, a major focal point of this episode. And, you know, there's yeah. so much there. Um, I love the growth um, and kind of the realization, and actualization. And one of the lines I wrote down was, uh, I already found my collective, you know, that I thought that was like a, a mm-hmm. poignant moment. Like I already have my group of people that I, it's that found family that we, yeah. keep, bringing, that we keep bringing up. Cause they're all kind you know, orphans in a way. So it's like, it's their found family. No, no, no. We, we're building off of the mid season finale where zero had, you know, we felt as a room really bad for zero, like zero. It wasn't, Zero's uh, fault that that Gwyn had gotten um, mind wiped, and so we wanted to reflect on like what is that internal struggle that Zero's going through, feeling mm-hmm. feeling like they are unforgivable, um, their inner guilt, yep. their yeah. inner guilt mm-hmm. uh, that they're mm-hmm. a weapon. And I think that that was a strong catalyst because we want to see Zero become the medical officer. We want to see Zero growing to that place because we think there's there's great irony in a non corporeal body person or person wanting to help corporeal bot people mm-hmm. you know there, yeah. there's something interesting there um, Plus, i love the focus the, oh. zero lives with the guilt like there's a lot of guilt not just with gwen but also just like you know picture this you're you're this person that just just the way you look destroys people's minds and you who knows how many times you've done it in your life so we're all you know from a, an audience member's point of view we're rooting for zero to just not have that guilt anymore yeah. and just they were used as a weapon you know it's yeah. it wasn't their fault yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah and what were you saying bonnie sorry i was saying i loved i loved not only that it focused on zero and and their growth but it focused on zero and gwen's friendship because you know we get we get little peanuts of it peanuts we get little like uh, hints of it right yeah we get little beans we get little yeah, we get little nuggets <laughs> of it, little, little love nuggets throughout the series you know showing um you know even from the beginning before she got mind wiped you know how she was uh in sick bay and 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 zero would always come and kind of comfort her and, and and helped her find her place on the ship um as the translator you know uh because it's not all about I love that line where, you know, it's not all, always about translation. It's about, I, I've already forgot the line, but you know, you know which one. Thank you. Interpretation. interpretation. Well, yeah. I, I, love zero Gwyn, I love Zero and Gwen scenes because they're both serious characters. and mm-hmm. They have great conversations, you know, where yeah. I feel like Jankum, yeah. you know, you know, Jankum and Dow together. I'm sure, I'm sure there'll be some depth to them. Hot dogs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that oh, one of the dogs. big things I got from this episode was about choice and like the power that each of us have to choose. I felt like Zero made the choice to, you know, break from the Borg collective. I felt like, uh, you know, Dal made some very good choices. We, we talked about um, Janeway in the beginning saying, I wouldn't do that if I were you. But if you are going to do it, let me give you the right information so that right. you're armed with, very good. you know, the knowledge. Um, but so giving them choices, giving them options. And, and I think that's another thing that um, lesson wise for children is, is excellent because, you know, life is full of these kinds of choices that we make and they have these consequences of, of, of hurting people or not hurting people. We talked about that in this episode or you guys did. And I just felt like those kinds of lessons resonate so well with me. And I love the way it's layered into a story that I like to follow as well. So it's, I, I'm getting really um, the edutainment of, 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 you know, Very this good. experience of, of the viewing experience. Can I add to that? Like I, w- now, yes, to everything that you're saying, well, what was the biggest choice that they made in this show to go onto the board queue? Mm-hmm. That was a bad choice. Right? <laughs> it's a Absolutely. They went in hoping to learn something, how to get rid of this weapon on board, and they don't in the end. They, they don't. Fail. What, yeah, what did they this gain? This whole episode nothing. is a fail. Right. They've gained nothing by this episode, right? But they are learning through failure, right? 
We didn't right. want to show where every day, learn. yay, we won the sword. We won this. We won this. We're just getting stronger, stronger, stronger. Because I'm like, that's not life. Well, they do right. learn. They do learn something valuable. They learn that they cannot get this weapon off the ship, which is a big thing. Right. Which, like, it, can, it can't be destroyed. Yeah. Lolly right. They learn also. something, yes, but they well, don't achieve what. They, yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. The, mm-hmm. the goal wasn't achieved, but they did. They achieved other goals that they didn't intend. You know, uh, zero uh, gained something. Gwen uh, gained something. They all kind of learned something. And it's always possible, you know, as a fan watching the show, we we know that at some point it's always possible that somewhere down the line they say, oh, just like when we were on that board ship or, you know, there's some kind of reference or some kind of growth in episode 40 that would not have happened if not for the growth that they, you know, got in episode 12 or something like that. So, mm-hmm. yeah, you know, point taken that so- the... We don't even yeah. realize that it was a failed mission because we're watching smaller successes. But it, but it tees up like, how are they going to get to Starfleet with this weapon aboard? It's not yeah. going to be easy. It's, it's you know, they can't just unscrew it and, and throw it off. And I was right. going to say, this is one of the grand master themes that only through failure comes great, greatness. You know, mm-hmm. that, right. I think that you'll see that it's very prevalent throughout the entire series. Well, I think what's important too, you're talking about... Um, Janeway's choices, and I, it was so important that hologram Janeway can only guide them. She cannot mm-hmm. make decisions for them. Like they are, they are in charge of their own fates. So they need to learn through trial and failure. You know um, how to and get that, through it. So uh, yeah, being assimilated is a safari. big failure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, the, <laughs> when they're on the sand planet and they meet the Samari creatures with uh, Dow's, you know, surrogate mother. You know, like. They totally fail. They totally mess up first contact, right? Mm. Um, but again, uh, they've been they, they've been failing so their important. way forward uh, really well. Yes. Uh, yes. I, I, it's it's been it's been remarkable to watch, and also they have shown that they've learned from the lessons that they have learned. That's mm-hmm. where what that's where we see the growth uh, from episode to episode. I kind of see that growth. Um, but no, I, I, that's what I, I want I just, kids to take away most from the show, right? I, I, right? Kids can watch this show and be entertained and learn it's okay to fail. And when I fail at something, I can keep going. Mm-hmm. I don't have to give up. I think that'd be amazing. Ne- you know who's never failed ever? Murph. Who? Murph can <laughs> do no wrong. Murph can do no wrong. That's true. That's true. No, I think one of my favorite. Even when Murph was fails, in- it's a success. <laughs> one of my favorite lines um i'll give credit to the writer's room um in episode 11 but there's a great moment where um hologram janeway is pinning that badge on dal and he we talked about like, that last week i'm yeah. afraid they're gonna you know see i'm a fraud you know mm-hmm. or to see who i really am and they're gonna like, see right through me they're gonna see yeah. right through me show them show them who you are because i think that's yeah. That's the key. It's like everyone goes through these things and you're scared. And but it just takes a little bit of courage to it's okay to be scared. You can still march on into the unknown. Because mm-hmm. um, I think that's what stops a lot of people is they feel like we're not going to succeed because I'm not good enough. And I'm like, you gotta at least just try. Like just take that first step. That's and why Sirak um, was saying last week that Dal and Gwen are the princess and the fraud. Right, Sirak? You said that. I remember. <laughs> uh, yeah. That's good. I like that. <laughs> we'll, great. we'll edit that. Oh, it was me that, that said that. I thought they were going to hate it. That's why I threw it on yeah, Sirak. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for that. <laughs> Trying to throw it on but Anyway, what were you saying, you know, Sirak? W- w- one of the big differences I see, too, um, through this second now, ha- I get this the halfway point. It feels like season two, but it's you know half of season one. I-, I-, I love that aspect of it, but you've given us so much already that it, it almost feels like season two. And one of the the big differences that I see at the midway point of this uh, first season is the introduction of the of the actual Janeway and an increase in her storyline. For example, capturing the Diviner, and um, and now we see the backstory about Chakotay, and 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 we see more expansion on that, which makes me feel that at some point you're going to have two shows, or you already do kind of have two. Yeah congruent shows that almost running at the same time well they're still connected though because admiral Janeway wants the protostar so you know it's it's two stories on a collision course so that's why right. it doesn't feel like two stories it feels like they're both how is it going right. to resolve mm-hmm. um, right 
like parallel I agree, I agree stories. With you, that the closer they get to track, yeah, the more track there is. Not even parallel. They're just they're coming. They're like not this. parallel. They're like right. perpendicular. Yeah, perpendicular. Yeah. yeah. Right. That's what there I meant go. to say. Math. 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 <laughs> and everyone knows more Janeway is best Janeway. So simple addition for not, you. We hope they're not yeah. parallel because they'll never intersect. Uh, <laughs> yeah, these stories will never meet, guys. Yeah. They'll never they'll be shit. It's like fly you by. get a everyone's be like wave. <laughs> that, that, you, know, you completely that's not what I thought was gonna happen. Uh, give yeah, them a mention, they give you a wow. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, they hmm. really didn't go anywhere with that. Wow. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's very daring of them. <laughs> Bold. <laughs> yeah. You would you would think there's boldly going ways. nowhere. Good yeah. job. <laughs> boldly not going. Uh, uh, but we also saw that um one of one of um the real Captain Janeway's crew members he he added a little bit of uh, a more you know his own version of comic relief into this episode. Doctor <laughs> N- uh, Noam, Dr. right? Noam. Played Noam. by Jason Noam. Alexander, Woo! right? Oh, really? And I'm, I'm listening for George no Costanza way. while while this Telluride is talking, and I can still only barely. I'm like, this guy is killing it. I'm so, little yeah, known I'm fact. So proud of Van- Mr. Vandalay wow. Industries. He's killing it. Yeah. Little known fact yeah. of Jason Alexander, he is actually also a magician and a member of the Magic Castle and has performed at the castle. And, wow. and also, he's there. such a great guy. Was it TNG? Who, no, he was in Voyager. He was in a Voyager yeah. episode. Yeah. The Think yeah, Tank. Absolutely. Think Tank, right? Huge fan of Star Trek. Super sweetest guy in the world. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we knew he was a fan. I remember we were trying to think of, like, you know, Jankum or Jason Manzukis is a Tellarite. And so we're like, you know, we it, who are we going to cast to play opposite uh, a Jason Manzoukas type, a cantankerous fellow? And then we're like, oh, my God, Jason Alexander. But I think even Jason, because like this was before any like Jason got into the recording booth before anything was seen. So I'm sure like most of the actors who come in, they're like, what is this show? Like, what is the tone? They don't know anything. They haven't seen anything. And so his first like apprehension was like. You, you guys just want me to do the George Costanza? We're like, no, 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 no. <laughs> he doesn't want to do that either, you know? So it was great to really kind of dive into who Dr. Noam is, which he feels like a bit of a surrogate bones, you know, of a cantankerous yeah. medical officer mm-hmm. who gives mm-hmm. you, who gives it to you straight, you know? Bones vibes. Mm-hmm. I like it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So. I tell you right, bones. Yeah. And yeah. I, I, he I, I had there's so a line with, the, with the worst. With the worst bedside manner, right? Yes, yes. Yeah. The line I, I think you were going to say, Dan. I was going to say early on, there's a moment where we're talking about Dr. Gnome. We're like, we want to make sure every Dr. Gnome line is a banger. We're like, every yeah. line that he says. Yes. Like, any any yeah. sign of life means I'm a miracle worker. That yeah, made me laugh. That was, that was good. <laughs> <laughs> or a kissing tail, the ensign's kissing oh, the, tail. Yeah. The kiss tail was just like that was classic. Yeah, yeah. That was, and she's like coming from a Tellerite. That is a compliment. Thank you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love man, that we this... get so many species represented, especially in a show right. where you know kids are watching this and might be seeing Star Trek for the first time. So they're getting first of all with with the Prodigy crew, you're getting so many different new ones. You know, I mean, look look with Rock Talk and uh, introducing Zero as you know with, as a Medusin, but like. Also showing, you know, the Andorian and the Trill and this and that. So, so kids watching will actually are actually getting like such a variety of mm-hmm. species on Star Trek, well, which on most shows you couldn't have that all the time because of budget cuts for makeup and whatnot. Um, mm-hmm. I feel like we really get to you really with Prodigy, you can like the sky's the limit because with animation you can yeah. have so many different species represented. Well, even with this Borg time. episode, right right away, we were like, hey, we don't just have to put people in makeup and, you know, like we can actually, like, let's have different species. Like the Borg would assimilate every species. Yeah. And so like we were able to use a couple extra models in this episode, but even in the original script, like we had really a vast diverse creatures and things that were, you know. Similar. Well, it costs a lot of money just to create a character just for an episode. So we can't right. just be like littering new. So I, I think if you go back yeah. into the minds of Tars Lamora, you'll look at like 
little background characters like that guy is bored now that guy's like you, you have to yeah, yeah, yeah. Really. you have to you have to reuse they're like costumes in your costume shop right and like right. hey do you want to spend another ten thousand dollars and build a new costume for this one episode or wait we got this guy let's strap <laughs> we have on a vacation board. cat no, no vacation kitty no i don't think vacation kitty should be don't board. make vacation yeah, kitty a board. i would <laughs> do you know oh, how yeah I've... i want to see a little bored kitty no Borgy kitty no. <laughs> uh, she had it coming <laughs> no I, I have a, look that cation kitty would not have been assimilated that thing would have fought tooth and nail <laughs> that's a that's that a badass cation team so bad i'm still holding out hope that we're gonna run into that cat again at some Cation. point uh-huh. yep. as a cat yeah, person where is she i was very excited He's the villain in season three Right. I, 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 you I, heard I, it here I, first, really people. Know. We got we got renewed for season yeah. three. No, just kidding. It's the message of the <laughs> cat. Wish. You say it, kids. No, I wish. <laughs> no, when I'm watching, uh, I, I feel like I feel like I'm watching Star Trek uh, as a kid, really kind of experiencing it with the same newness that the the characters are experiencing it with, and it's great to feel yeah. that way. And one of the the things, you know, just like going back to these great lessons that I love the way you infuse it into the story. Um, I was thinking about the Borg and seeing the Borg for the first time. If I was a kid and I'm in that that cube, and when you kind of pan back and I see these all these people in their hive, you know, you know, uh, waiting to be aw- uh, aw- awoken or awaken. Um, a lot of those things were like, I was like, oh, this is a grand thing. But the lesson that I felt was amazing was when Janeway says to Gwen, Lower your they, you know, yeah, if you're not a threat, you know, they'll ignore you, you know, something like to that effect. Mm-hmm. And that, yeah, it, we it, extract all that great board stuff that we can. And we have, you know, it's a 22 minute episode, but we probably only have like 15 minutes to spend in that board cube or eat probably less. It's like, what right. do you want to instill? What are those moments? Mm-hmm. And you're right. That shot where you see, you know, they're, they're really are, they're like zombies. It's like they're, right. they're the equivalent Hibernating. of space zombies. Yeah. You know, right. Smart technological space zombies. And that shot of all of them there is frightening. Oof. And there's also that great moment of, I always remember watching those episodes, just those dead eyes, the way they react to you. Like they don't, they don't look at you as if, they're connecting and there's that moment where Gwen's sneaking by and there's one that looks at her and sees she's not a threat. It's just that those dead eyes are just so gosh darn creepy. Mm-hmm. But also teaches kids about being fearless in some moments. I think the lesson about mm-hmm. not being a threat, uh, mm-hmm. you know, that is a real lesson for kids out here uh, who are trying to survive in the streets, wherever they live. And yeah. if, if, they don't, saying, like, if they don't appear to be a threat, then they will likely be ignored and they will survive. And, and, you know, when you, when you stand out as a threat, that's what brings negative energy towards you in general. So these are kind of miniature lessons that, mm. you know, kids can extract from and, and really learn from. And, and, and it could, well, so it like could Mike, be a life or Mike death. Doesn't always, Mike doesn't always get you through, you know. Funny. Yeah, you can't yeah. beat up Maybe everybody. it's not the way to resolve a conflict. There's other yeah, ways. Yeah, physical violence might not be the answer for everyone. Well, use your, use your head. And, <laughs> yeah. If you're the small dog in the fight, you're like, I don't, you know. Yeah, use your head. Uh, have trust and faith. That's another thing because she has to have faith to have the courage to put her weapon away and say, okay, yeah. let me just well, Janeway's trust Janeway. Like, trust yeah. me, yeah. Mm-hmm. So great lessons, I think. And once again, kudos to you guys for just making a fantastic show that is laced with so much growth and development for children out there who watch, as well as the adventure of experiencing Star Trek in a new way. Um, I think you guys are doing some groundbreaking uh, stuff here with this show. It feels like a movie. Um, and like I said, I, I don't think there's a better um, binge watch than this kind of a show. This is going to eventually become one of the great binge watches of Star Trek. Mm-hmm. Thank you. I mean, Thank honestly, you. It's, it's the greatest pleasure to write. It's the greatest pleasure to work on. It's some of the most fun we've ever had making a show. So um, I would say it's easy. It's not, but um, we're enjoying it every minute of our time working. <laughs> Mm-hmm. And as someone who's just a small pebble in the pile of rocks of the show, it's mm-hmm. such a 
honor to be in the pile of rocks. Oh, Bonnie, you're not. Maybe that's not like a. That's probably not the best analogy that I come up with. You're a piece in the puzzle. We're all pieces in the puzzle. I'm a really cute pebble, but no, I mean, like before, I think with Bonnie on on your podcast, but like, it's great to um, to bring in truck fans to work with us because it's like Mm. we want to feel the love. We want to feel the camaraderie of a team of we're all working for the same thing which is to make the best trek that we possibly can in our little lives so that's it mm-hmm. i'd like to point out a couple uh a couple of ep- uh, lines that i thought were delivered very well that made me laugh um and they were both from jankum pog uh first when he said the borg never assimilated a turbo lift that was clever and funny <laughs> yeah. it worked yeah. for me uh, yeah. <laughs> the other one was when he said, you know, when he was looking for buttons, starting to freak out here, funny lines, but especially great delivery there. Like, yeah. I really, mm-hmm. I really appreciate, you know, it's got to be such, such a gift to write out lines or to think of moments. And then an actor then not just brings it to life, but adds something even more to it. I think uh, the legendary John Noble, I think, does that as well. And mm-hmm. a lot of these mm-hmm. actors do just about all of them, but Rock especially talk. Riley, yes, she's my she's favorite. Killer. Every, she's every so delivery good. she does makes me happy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Another line was no way Jenkin flies in a cube. I thought that was. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. In a box, in a box, in a box. In a box. In a box. Flies in yeah. a box. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then when they're inside and he's like admiring it, Gwen's like, now he's a fan of the box. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. The, tur- the turbo lift line. I remember we were like in the writer's room talking about, okay, they have to climb up. They're climbing. And someone's like, wow, well, I don't know if they have a. <laughs> what? Yeah. <You> know? <laughs> like, and we're like, yeah. Yeah. Like- well, it's probably guys- the cube is probably all controlled by the collect. You know, like even if it did, they probably wouldn't be able to get it to work because I think it's all like connected mind wise uh, with the Borg. So even if they did have some kind of lift uh, to get somewhere, um, I don't think yeah. they'd be able to control it. That's why there was no consoles or buttons, too. So do the yeah. Borg just <laughs> take stairs everywhere uh, or ladders or do they just card. all stay on their respective levels? What's their situation? It's a fireman's pole, man. It's there's yeah. the whole shit. Yeah. That's fun. I think I just can't picture a board going into a turbo lift and pushing a button. I know. And, like, and then they all just kind of like yeah. stare at the, the numbers to avoid eye yeah. contact. What are they, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Deck five. I, I, uh, what are, that, I that, is, uh. that is one of my what are, yeah, one of my favorite moments is the moment where he has to hit like uh, Jank and Pog is like, okay, I'll I'll turn this off, but he's like looking around and there's He's like, I'll even a joystick, anything, like is yeah, there any sort yeah. of control here that I could, you know. I love it. <laughs> yeah. I have mm-hmm. to say, like our actors, we record them more like an animated movie. A lot of times, in animated TV for budget, you just bring them all in uh, and record them all in one shot, and they're gone. And we've got such tremendous actors that they're all working. They're all shooting live action shows and movies, and they're all around the world. So. Most of the time we're recording virtually and we get one actor at a time. And the the joy of that is just that one-on-one with them. And they can improvise. They have the time and the space to improvise and to find the character and goof around and add something or us to really like dive deeper and trying to find a really interesting delivery of the line, which you can't do normally. I don't get much opportunity to improv because i'm i'm a ship but uh computer (laughs) but i do remember when we recorded this episode the original line was like unknown vessel detected and i was like "Mm, i'm pretty sure they'd know i think brooke too we were like i'm pretty sure they would know a board cube so we we changed it because it wasn't an unknown vessel it was like it was like vessel detected or you know that's the hardest thing about star yeah that's great the hardest thing about star trek is that there's just so many um uh, it's hard to be on top like of everything. There's, something's always going to yep. fall out, whether it's a star date. I remember there was an issue with a star date that that people brought up. It was the time a muck episode, oh. and you know, well, I, you know, I don't know how many people can like say they know understand star dates. I can say I don't understand star dates. <laughs> I've never. It, it's a math thing. I still so. don't. Yeah, I'm still going yeah, parallel. Dr. Aaron yeah. Does it for us. yeah. Well, I do have we the had man, the doctor, right? Aaron. We had this. We had the correct start date recorded, but for whatever reason, like an earlier version of the voice actor uh, of Kate, I think delivered an older, or maybe it was Dallas. I forgot mm-hmm. who gave the start date, but 
someone had an old version that was wrong, but it had gone through all these different processes where we're watching, you know, we're watching an animatic for the 18th time. And I hear the star date and I'm not thinking that's the wrong star date because I don't know what the right star date it is. And it had gotten through all of our defenses and the wrong star date got put in. And luckily, Walky, I think on Twitter, I think fans were like, wait a minute, this episode takes place two years later. And Walkie's like, no, 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 because they were by Tachyon Storm. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Timey, wimey, okay. wibbly, wobbly. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say, lucky for <laughs> you job. guys, Star Trek fans don't usually notice that kind of stuff. Well, boy, they just let everything yeah. go by. Oh, so, so, yeah. Nitpick. Mistakes happen. We are fallible. Like that, you know, there's things that Oh, happen. my gosh. I, I won't that say. I, I can, I'm trying to remember. I think it's an upcoming episode. But like even like when you're animating and you're looking at, at at the animation and the colors and you're trying to get everything right, like for whatever reason, all of us missed out. There's like a shot of like zero legs. with zero's legs. And then you cut to something else, cut back to zero and some friends and zero's now hovering with no legs. And cut back <laughs> to the other people talking. Come and you back think it's easy, like we just go back and again. animate you're like, and, and we can't yeah. do anything about it. Like you get to a place yeah. where you're like, we can't change that. It just yeah. has to be an error. You know, yeah. zero's just yeah. stretching legs. Sure. That's it. Just you can't uh, be just perfect. stretching out. Yeah, yeah. That's all. Yeah, exactly. So we know we're going to get attacked on it. So just mm -hmm. put that out there. We're sorry. So yeah. we've only got a couple minutes left uh, before we have to run. But uh, Kevin and Dan, this is so cool. We're so glad that you are the ones heading this operation. And I think. So many of the Star Trek fans, myself included, were so surprised by this show because, like, personally, I'm going to watch this show because it's Star Trek. And they say it's a kid's show. I'm like, okay, well, I'll, uh, I guess I'll stomach a kid's show just to see. But it is so yeah. very Star Trek. Like, we recognize the themes. We recognize the aliens. We recognize some of the storylines that are picked up, like the Borg. And it feels very Star Trek. And you are actually expanding the star trek universe and adding to the lore and that's what makes it super exciting for all the fans is wait a minute we are actually getting more star trek this isn't just a kid's show this is just more star trek you guys are adding to that universe mm -hmm. and i'm just very happy that you know they chose you and uh you guys you know aimed for an emmy <laughs> thank you thank you imagine our frustrations of like when that first pilot came out you know you would hear from some critics going this isn't star trek this isn't you know and i'm like it, it in my mind they just seem so small because i'm like you're not just wait patient yeah. Yeah. like just do you know what a story is? There's going to be change, and there's going to be new worlds, and the characters well, going to get age. Out, to, out of yeah. the ordinary world into the new world, and like the new world will be Star Trek. Don't we? Don't worry. <laughs> Hot takes uh, 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 I, I, I have to confess, I I didn't have really. I I had very low expectations coming into watching this whole show. I, I didn't expect this going to be as good as it is, and so I'm even more blown away as I watch it. I'm just like, wow. I, I should not have underestimated these guys because they are <laughs> really kicking ass. Um, so you. yeah, um, that's that's what I uh, appreciate about watching this show. It's just so uh, so riveting. The stories are amazing, and you know, you guys are really carrying the torch for the Star Trek family. And uh, very very proud that uh, you guys are putting in this much quality time and work and effort to produce mm -hmm. these kinds of results and it, it's just paying off and it, it will continue to because I, I love it. I think people of all ages will love it and it, it just makes sense. And one more, one other thing I will add for years, I've heard rumors of Starfleet Academy and would they make an animated Starfleet Academy or would they mm -hmm. make a show and um, never, you know, never had it materialized, but if it were to have materialized, it, it could not have been any better than what you guys are doing right Ooh. now with the adventures of these these young guys. So um, mm. that's my now. Kudos. Now there is going to be a Starfleet Academy you. show in like a year or two, and we're eventually going to have the showrunner on on our show. As, as, as well, long as we're all like going to pretend like it's right as long as it's there. you guys. Wasn't yeah, there one? I, I think. I think whenever they were like announcing new Star Trek shows, like possibly in the works when they were mentioning yeah, Section one. 31, there's one that's in the works that I'm like 
I mean, I, I've been trying to get information like crazy. I've been like, I Google Perfectly it like every in. couple of weeks because I, I would <laughs> love to audition for something like that because that sounds so much fun. But, mm -hmm. um, but speaking mean, of... Only, oh, go ahead. I just want to say, I, I think we can only attribute the success of the show is that I think Kevin and I feel very, very fortunate and lucky to to be in this world. And I think we we were writers who... We got a big, we got our big break, but nothing got made for like 10 years. And so we're hungry, we're thirsty, we're like, and so when we do get opportunities, we, we never take it for granted and we go, we have this opportunity, let's make it the very best we possibly can do. Like, I think it's like, I think there's a lot of people who might go, oh, it's an animated Star Trek. Yeah, it'll be little Kirk, little Spock, and they'll come across, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, let like, me get no, back to my go. live action movie script that I'm working on. Yeah. We're yeah. always like, we get the privilege to try to entertain you for an hour or mm -hmm. for a half hour. And so we're always like asking ourselves, how would we entertain ourselves for half an hour? What does it need to be? What is it? What should it not be? So I think we're doing all those things when fans go, I don't like the show for this reason, or I like the show for that reason. We're having all of those conversations. And I think we, I think oh, we're so proud of, again, I think the smartest thing we did were the people we hired. And I think we surrounded ourselves with people who, Go no, Dan and Kevin, you're being dumb dumbs. Don't do that. I mean, and we could tell you a lot of those stories, but I, but it would spoil stuff. But uh, but we're we're saved by the crew that's on the ship. So I think you know we have to give credit to them. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yep. And uh, best thing Paramount did was hire you guys. On that note, absolutely. Uh, so uh, Kevin and Dan, thank you so much for joining us. We hope to see you again sometime. And uh, unless you're too busy making amazing shows, then please just keep doing that. Uh, because yes. that, that's all we want and all we need as Star Trek fans. Um, Bonnie, awesome as always. Thank, Thank you for playing you. along. I love being here. Oh, my cat. Oh, Sirak, let's fine. talk about basketball in a minute. And, <laughs> all right. uh, oh, oh, let us give some very special thanks to a few of our favorite people. Uh, this one, Srock sings, these are a few of my favorite fans. People. Uh, Homer Frizzell, Dr. Anne-Marie Seagull, Eve England out in Wales, Yvette Blackman, Tom, Carmen, a.k.a. Skillet, Timothy okay. Baum, TJ Jackson Bay out in Missouri, Bill Victor Arukin. Uh, Arukin. There it is. Titus <laughs> Muller, Darlena Marie, John Mann, Dr. Muhammad Noor, Tierney C. Diekman mm -hmm. on a post, Rex A. Wood, Anil O. Palat, Erica Strom, Joe Balserati, Mike Gu, DQ, Neil Akasaka, Justine Norton Kurtzen, Dr. Stephanie Baker, Carrie Schwent, Faith Howell, Edward Foltz, Radek Orshevsky, you know, out in Southwest Poland, Henry Unger, Mai, live from Tokyo, Matt Boardman, and of course, Dr. Susan V. Gruner. That's it for us, everybody. Uh, Go watch more Prodigy. Go back and rewatch it. What the hell, right? You got a week before the next one. Uh, and everybody at home, we'll see you next time. Until then, always remember the seventh rule. <laughs>